This is Ethan Schlebowski, a self-proclaimed home cooking nerd who does entertaining, beginner-friendly cooking videos here on YouTube. A while back, Ethan posted a video where he shared two different ways he likes to cook smoky barbecue ribs, but in his home oven. So as the barbecue commentary man, I'm gonna give you my insights on his technique and let you know if I think his recipe is legit or not. And I am a huge fan of Ethan's content, so I am super stoked to do this. So enough talking and let's get into this. In most cases, a smoking setup for ribs is an indirect heat source with wood, whether chips, logs, or pellets that waft smoke over the meat at temperatures around 225 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So I like that Ethan said in most cases when he gave his temperatures, because honestly, you can cook ribs at so many different temperatures. Personally, when I'm cooking on my offset, I like to go between 275 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and sometimes I even go up to 325 degrees Fahrenheit when I'm in a hurry. But being able to cook at almost any temperature is pretty common for most, if not all, cuts of barbecue, and you learn that the more and more you practice. For ribs, this cooking method is used for two main reasons. Number one, turn collagen into gelatin, and number two, smoky flavor. So turning collagen into gelatin and smoky flavor are definitely key components to a good barbecue rib. But another trademark that I would add to this list is a good crust on the ribs. If you don't pay attention to the crust, the seasoning could wash off or you could end up with these big blobs of chewy unrendered fat on top of the ribs. But with that said, if you have cooked your ribs to the point where the collagen has completely broken down, in most cases, the crust will be set as well. From the book Meathead, The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling, we learn that ribs have high amounts of connective tissue. This connective tissue has collagen, which is spread out throughout the meat, and when it is cooked, it melts and turns into gelatin and gives ribs that succulent mouthfeel. So collagen breakdown, in my opinion, is the most important component of making good barbecue, whether you're doing ribs, brisket, or even chicken legs. Because like Ethan is saying, when the collagen breaks down into gelatin, the meat gets tender, but at the same time, it gets really juicy. But if you don't break down the collagen, then the meat gets really tough and it's just super chewy. Personally, I can deal with dry barbecue, burnt barbecue, and even over seasoned barbecue. But if I have to chew on big chunks of unrendered fat and connective tissue, I just won't eat it. The great thing for us, all of that can be done in an oven. Just set the temperature to 225 degrees Fahrenheit, for several hours and away you go to gelatinized collagen heaven. The big differentiator is number two, and that is smoky flavor. But what do you do if you were like me in an apartment where getting a grill isn't the most feasible option? <laughs> I like how he says getting a grill isn't a feasible option, but then he brings out this massive homemade foil satellite. Kettle on Facebook Marketplace, not feasible. But this, feasible. <laughs> In my mind, you have two options. The first option is as simple as applying liquid smoke to the ribs while dry brining and adding a drop or two to your barbecue sauce which will be glazed on to provide an extra layer of smoky flavor. Obviously, since we aren't actually smoking with this method, it's gonna give a much different kind of smoky flavor and we definitely won't see a pink smoke ring. Smoke ring is more about presentation than anything because personally I've had ribs and brisket that had a very thick smoke ring and had very little smoke flavor and I've had brisket and ribs that had barely any smoke ring and a strong smoke flavor. According to Meathead Goldwyn's website, amazingribs.com, the smoke ring is a reaction of the protein you're smoking to the nitric oxide produced from the smoke. But the nitric oxide doesn't give us that rich, smoky, complex flavor that we get from barbecue. Instead, the flavor comes from the carbonyls that are released from the burning of the lignin in the wood. As explained by pitmaster Harry Sue in his fire management video, link in the description. So in layman's terms, a smoke ring does not equal smoke flavor, but it looks nice. The second method needs a little bit more explaining. Again from Meathead, we learned that smoke sticks best to both wet and cold surfaces. I painted these two cans white and filled one with ice water and one with nothing. Then I placed them in my smoker and after smoking for just 15 minutes, the one with ice water clearly has more smoke on it. This means for us, the keys for smoking are using cold meat and maintaining a humid environment. So cold meat and a humid environment can definitely result in more smoke on the meat. I don't disagree with Ethan's science here, but I do have two problems with his soda can experiment. First of all, I wish he would have experimented with four cans instead of two. So of course the original two he had, the cold water can and the empty can, but if he had a third can that was cold and empty and then a fourth can that was filled with room temperature water. With four cans instead 
instead of two, we would have been able to see a lot more in the margins as to which factor contributes to more smoke. Is it the coldness of the can or the presence of water? My second problem is the empty can is a poor representation of the ribs he's about to cook. According to meatscience.org, pork has a water content of 75%, not 0% like the empty can. But again, not a science guy, so maybe I'm just overlooking something. And even in the extreme case, if chilling the ribs or adding a bowl of water did absolutely nothing to the ribs, it's not like it's gonna negatively affect it in any way, so it doesn't really matter. Using a paper towel for grip, remove the silver skin membrane from the underside of the ribs. Place a wire rack over a baking sheet on top of the scale, then add the ribs and note the weight down. Calculate 1% salt and sprinkle over top of the ribs evenly, and then we're gonna let this dry brine in the fridge for at least one hour before cooking. So great idea here to measure the salt if you're a beginner, because if you over salt your ribs, it will absolutely ruin them. And because of the bone to meat ratio, pork ribs are some of the easiest cuts to oversalt. Also, if I'm using an oven or a cooker that doesn't have a lot of convection, then I love dry brining. Because dry brining dries out the surface of the meat, which speeds up the browning or Maillard reaction that develops the crust. The barbecue lingo for this crust is called the bark. And in barbecue, you can never have too much bark. So I take advantage of every trick I can to get the bark set early. Once brined, pull the ribs out and sprinkle the rib rub all over until a thin layer has covered every nook and cranny and just rub the rub. Oh, no, 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 no. So for those of you who have watched these commentaries before, you probably already know what I'm about to say. Never rub your rub. Rubbing your ribs will give them a horrible pasty texture when they're done. But padding is fine like Ethan's doing here, so maybe he just misspoke. To prepare the smoker, cut two square pieces of aluminum foil and place a handful of wood chips in a thin layer on the foil, then fold that into a rectangular packet containing the wood chips and poke a little hole in the top to allow smoke to escape. So Ethan actually makes two of these wood chip packets, preheats them on his stove top, places them in a baking sheet with a pan of water in the middle, suspending his rack of ribs, and then wraps his contraption together inside of a big foil tent. So wood chips are very dry. So as a result, they do not produce a lot of smoke flavor. And these packets were made super small and thin. And mind you, he doesn't replace them for the entire cook. So that initial 30 minutes of smoking is all he's getting. So with the amount of work it takes to make this foil tent, I'm seriously doubting if it's worth the smoke flavor that you're gonna end up with. At the stove, place one end of the baking sheet over medium high heat. Then turn on the range hood fan and open the windows in your apartment because there's a good chance that you're gonna set off your fire alarm. What? <laughs> okay, all right. All right. So I absolutely love the creativity here. And I say this a lot. There is not enough creativity in the barbecue scene, so I, it fully encourage this type of innovation. But you all saw all the steps and parts of this convoluted contraption. And like I said before, he's not gonna get a lot of smoke flavor from those two little foil packets. And now you're telling me that I'm likely gonna set off the smoke alarm? To me, this just doesn't seem feasible at all. If I was watching this video and I lived in an apartment, then at this point I would turn it off, grab my ribs, go downstairs to the community barbecue pit, and then just cook them there. Or better yet, just make oven ribs with no smoke. Once smoked, slide the entire sheet of ribs into the oven and cook for three and a half to four hours. After the time is up, I like to completely remove the aluminum foil and cook for another 30 minutes to one hour to let the crust develop. It's interesting to see how a lot of these oven rib recipes like to wrap the ribs and then cook them and then unwrap them to finish so that they can get a good crust. For outdoor barbecue, the common practice is to cook the ribs unwrapped to develop the crust and then wrap them to finish the cook and get the meat tender and also to break down the collagen. It kind of reminds me of cooking steak because some people like to reverse sear it and others like to sear it first and then cook it after. I don't know, it's just an interesting observation. Towards the end of cooking, you can intermittently check the doneness of the ribs by probing the meat until around 195 degrees Fahrenheit, but this can be a little bit hard to get accurate since the bones are there, so I like to actually perform the bend test for this. The bend test is done by picking up the rack with tongs and bouncing the ribs. If the surface cracks, the ribs are ready. There are many ways to check if the ribs are done. Me personally, I like to poke them with a temperature probe or a skewer to see how easily it punctures. And also I like to pick them up and give them a squish and also just bounce them around to see if the collagen feels broken down. But if you're an absolute beginner and you have no idea how the ribs should feel, then my suggestion is just to cook 
the heck out of them until the meat is falling off the bone. Because pork ribs have such a high fat content, if you're cooking low and slow, it's nearly impossible to dry out the ribs. Like seriously, if you look at the nutrition facts on a pack of pork ribs, you'll see that the fat to protein ratio is nearly 50-50. With the ribs cooked, slather a thin layer of barbecue sauce all over the ribs, then turn the broiler on high and place the ribs underneath to caramelize the sauce. Keep an eye on it so that sauce doesn't burn. You really just want the sauce to just barely lose its sheen and turn a darker brown. For my taste, I think the barbecue sauce that Ethan used was a little too thick. Because you can see after he broils it and the sauce reduces down, it almost looks like acrylic paint, which is totally fine. I just don't prefer that texture. I like to use a thinner sauce like Stubbs or Goldie's barbecue sauce because it just leaves a really nice glossy finish on the ribs. But if your favorite sauce is a thicker one like Sweet Baby Ray's, then you can also thin it out by adding some apple cider vinegar to it. For the liquid smoke ribs, on the other hand, it's much easier. Okay, so I already see a massive problem with Ethan's second method. But before I tell you what that is, I think it'll be helpful to know the rest of the steps in Ethan's liquid smoke rib recipe. So after applying the liquid smoke, Ethan applies salt and lets it dry brine. Then he adds his rib rub, wraps it in foil, and cooks it for about four hours at 225. And during the last 30 minutes of the cook, he unwraps them so that the crust can finish. Then he brushes on some barbecue sauce that has a few drops of liquid smoke in it and the ribs are done. And I will say both of his racks of ribs looked fantastic. Some of the best oven ribs I've seen on YouTube. And he did a great job with not overcooking the ribs to the point where they fall off the bone, but still cooked enough to get a nice clean bite. But with that said, once Ethan tasted his ribs side by side, he said that he preferred his foil tent smoked ribs over the liquid smoke ribs. And if I tried them both, I'd probably agree with him because of that big mistake I saw him make when he was prepping the liquid smoke ribs and don't worry we'll get to that soon but what was interesting was his explanation as to why he preferred his foil smoked ribs that being said i definitely do prefer this one it's what i'm used to you know it's real smoke it definitely makes a difference compared to kind of the the liquid smoke which is like that commercial smoke taste but i believe that it had this off flavor not because of the liquid smoke itself but because of how he used it so liquid smoke isn't this synthetic chemical compound that's made in a lab it's basically just wood smoke that's been condensed into liquid form. Alton Brown demonstrated this in an episode of Good Eats I saw a while ago where he made liquid smoke in his own backyard using a tent, a bunch of ice, and a bunch of other tools that I can't remember off the top of my head. Unfortunately, I couldn't find that episode of Good Eats to reference for this video, but luckily enough, Ballistic Barbecue here on YouTube recreated Alton Brown's liquid smoke machine. Now you can watch Ballistic Barbecue's video linked in my description if you wanna know how he constructed his machine. But the main thing I wanna address is that after three and a half hours of burning wood, melting ice, and collecting the smoke-filled condensation, he was left with only a third of a cup of liquid smoke. So as you can imagine, based on the yield, liquid smoke is highly concentrated. And this concentrate is exactly what Ethan poured all over his ribs before he dry brined them. And I know this because I have the same exact brand of liquid smoke with me here, Wright's Liquid Smoke Concentrated Seasoning. Now there are less concentrated brands out there like this one I got from Walmart that are diluted with vinegar, water, molasses, and other ingredients. So it's not nearly as strong as the Wright's brand. The Walmart liquid smoke definitely has a strong flavor, but it also has like this sweetness to it that kind of rounds it out. But even so, it's still pretty strong. Like if I were using this as a binder, then I would definitely still dilute it. Whew. Wow, that is gross. This tastes like alcohol. That is way stronger. It has like this sharp, acidic taste to it. It's it's pretty bad. The back of the Wright's bottle actually has instructions for use, which say that you should use two teaspoons per cup of marinade. This is a liquid smoke concentration of about 4%, but Ethan put liquid smoke directly on his ribs. That's 100% concentration, almost 25 times more than the recommended amount. So I think if he would have cut the liquid smoke with some Worcestershire or some mustard or even water, then his ribs would have turned out way better. Perhaps just as good as his foil tent ribs with way less hassle. So with that said, is Ethan's oven rib recipe legit? Well, if you made the few minor tweaks that 
I mentioned in this video, then I fully believe that you will have some of the best oven ribs you've ever had in your life. So it gets a legit for me. But what's even more legit is the fascinating discovery I made watching Google Foods microwave brisket experiment. So make sure to watch the next video on your screen to find out what that is, and I'll see you guys over there.